So I started writing this book because I wanted to write a book first about the science of relationships between parents and children. And then my own children had children. I became a grandmother for the first time around the same time that I was writing the book. And what struck me was how much uh, being a parent had changed even in the 30 years between when I had my children and now. And a way of kind of summarizing that difference is that a picture about what parents and children should be like had become increasingly, uh, increasingly influential. And this picture thought about being a parent as kind of like a carpenter. So you, you can have a picture in your head of the kind of child that you want to create. And if you just do the right things and buy the right apps and read the right books, you'll be able to create a child who has the right kind of features, the way a carpenter who's, who's competent and knowledgeable ends up creating a chair. And that picture is sort of encapsulated in that very word, parenting, which interestingly only showed, started to show up in English in, in the 1970s. People had always talked about being a parent or uh, having children, but the idea that there was this activity of parenting, something you could do that would make your children come out better, that's a very recent idea. Mm -hmm. And that picture is very different from what I think of as the gardener picture. If you're a gardener, at least if you're a gardener like me, nothing ever comes out the way that you expect it to. And both the most wonderful, glorious things in the garden and the most frustrating things in the garden are the unexpected things that come out of the blue. But there's actually a deeper reason for that. And the deeper reason for that is that when you create a garden, what you want to do is create an ecosystem. You want to create a protected, nurturing space in which there's lots of scope for variation and possibility and difference. Lots of different kinds of things can go on. And that kind of unpredictable, messy, variable kind of system, kind of think of it as being like a, a hedgerow or, or, a, cotton, or a, a, a cottage garden rather than an a orchid hothouse. That's more like what the science tells us children were designed to be. So every generation of children gives us a chance to do things that are new and taking care of children is about providing a protected, rich space in which all this unpredictable variety can develop rather than making children who come out a particular way. Well, I think part of the reason why uh, this carpenter picture developed in the end of the 20th century was because really for the first time parents were people were having children who hadn't actually raised children very much themselves when they were growing up. For most of human history, by the time you had children yourself, you'd had lots of younger siblings and cousins and younger brothers and sisters, and you'd had lots of experience of caregiving and watching other people take care of children. Um, so I think one very simple thing is to uh, get experience with just watching good caregivers and seeing the way they interact with the children around them. But in general, I think that um, uh, what in America we would call chilling out is a good idea. So in general, you can pretty much bet that, that you're more worried than you need to be <laughs> about what your children will be like and how your children will turn out. And I think a very good first step is to shift the focus away from thinking, what, how will this affect him 20 years from now when he grows up? Um, will it, what I do now, how will what I do now have consequences later on, and instead think, what can I do right now that would let me and me as this particular parent with my particular characteristics and this particular child, what would let us thrive in this moment at this point, rather than trying to think about it as if it's this long-term uh, process that's going to have particular kinds of outcomes. Mm. Well, one of the things that we're finding more and more is that even if you look at children's brains, children seem to be designed to learn in this very exploratory, creative way. They're designed to consider lots of different alternatives. So if you look at a, a baby's brain, for example, what you see is that babies initially, in the first five years, are making many, many more new synapses, new neural connections, um, than they will later on. And what happens is that as you get older, although you continue to make new connections, you make fewer new connections and you prune the ones that are there. So what happens is as you get older, as a result of experience, some of the connections get stronger and more efficient, work better. 
and then the connections that you don't use just kind of disappear. And that's actually a good thing. That actually makes your brain efficient and effective and it makes it able to do all the things that uh, adult brains can do, like you know, get out of the house in the morning and go to preschool. Um, but it also has a downside, it has a disadvantage. And the trade-off is that that efficiency and swiftness and focus and ability to inhibit all the things that are important for us as adults shut down some of the possibilities for learning and exploration and finding out new things that we see in very young children. So there seems to be this kind of trade-off between an early brain that's really, really designed to learn. And from an evolutionary perspective, children really are there for learning. That's what children are all about. That's the thing they do best and the thing they're really designed to do. And then a later brain that can take all the things that we learned when we were children and put them to use to do all the things that we need to do as adults too to act effectively, to make things happen out in the world, to, to do the things that we need to do. So a way I put it sometimes is that it's as if babies and young children are the research and development division of the human species and we're production and marketing. So they're exploring every new possibility that they can think of and we take those possibilities that we explored when we were young and we put them to use to solve the kind of adult problems that we need to solve. Well, of course, one of the interesting things is that we just take for granted the fact that children play. Um, and if you look at essentially every animal with a brain, one of the things about those animals is that early on in life they play. But it's still kind of mysterious about why it is that they would do that. After all, the whole definition of play is that play is something you do that's different from work. It's something that you do for its own sake. It's something that you do that doesn't have an obvious outcome. And I think for many years, people who worked closely with children, like early childhood educators and parents and so forth, have had this intuition that children learn through play and they're finding out about the world through play. But it's only been really relatively recently that we discovered scientifically, that we could show scientifically that that was true, because of course it's very hard to take something that's a spontaneous and uh, uh, and natural and unconstrained as play and actually study it in the lab. But people have, have been starting to do this and, and what they've discovered is sort of amazing. In fact, I was just writing uh, my uh, Wall Street Journal column about this this week about a new study that just came out where they showed that with two-year-olds, um, you show, what they did was they showed two-year-olds a uh, machine that worked on a particular abstract principle. So either it worked because you put a particular color on it or a particular kind of shape on it. And in just five minutes of leaving the two-year-old alone with these machines, the babies, the toddlers had worked out what the abstract principle was that made the machines go. And they did it just by sitting and playing and putting things on the machine. And there's more and more evidence to suggest that that's, that's right. And again, learning in that kind of playful way lets you explore a range of possibilities that you don't necessarily explore when you're, when you're just in a pedagogical situation. One of the other things that we've discovered is that even very young children, three and four year olds, are quite sensitive to whether or not they're being taught. And if they think that someone's being a teacher, they narrow the range of solutions they consider to the ones that that teacher is offering. Whereas if they are just playing, they'll think about a much wider variety of different kinds of options, different things they could do, different things to explore. Now, one of the real particular mysteries is that uh, for human children in particular, from the time they're about 18 months old, one of the things they do is they engage in this kind of unstoppable, crazy, um, wide, wide ranging pretend play. Um, and no one's ever quite been able to figure out what's that doing? It's so important to children. But we have some ideas, and we did an experiment in my lab where we looked at how well children could do something called counterfactual thinking. So counterfactual thinking is when you say, uh, what would have happened if I'd have missed the train today? Oh, if only I hadn't, you know, uh, if, I ha if only I hadn't lost the ticket, then I would have been here an hour earlier, which is actually a true counterfactual for today. Um, uh, 
that kind of counterfactual thinking, being able to think about things that could have happened but didn't, it's a really important part of our adult ability to think. So if you think about a scientist, for instance, scientists are always saying, what would the world be like if it was a bit different? You know, Einstein's saying, what would it be like? Let's imagine what would happen if the speed of light was, was fixed. And what we discovered was that children who pretended more were also the children who were making more of these kind of counterfactual inferences, were more, better at thinking about things that could have happened but didn't. And another link that people have found between pretend play and understanding is, of course, when children are pretending, very often they're pretending about other people. They're pretending to be, you know, the great Superman, or they're pretending that they're having a tea party, or in one of my, my favorite kinds of pretend, imaginary companions, children will just make up an imaginary friend who shows up in their house. And there's some data that shows that that kind of pretend play, especially things like having an imaginary friend, is connected to children's ability to understand what's going on in the minds of other people, which is, again, one of the really central things that even very young children have to do. Well, I think one of the things that's really come out is that many of the intuitions that carers have about, um, about children, sort of anybody who's spent a lot of time with young children, um, has these intuitions about things like the fact that they're learning through play, the fact that by giving them uh, warmth and love and affection and attention, those are the things that are really going to be the most important for their, for their cognitive development. But I think increasingly the people who have that kind of skill, like the carers and the early childhood educators, are caught in a, like a kind of pincer movement between parents, on the one hand, who've read about things like brain development and think, oh, okay, this is my chance to turn my child into a genius, um, and also policymakers who are willing to invest in early childhood but want to think, do, it, do it thinking, oh, this will provide school readiness, this will make children do better when they're actually going to school. And both those things have meant that there's a lot of pressure on early childhood programs to look more and more like schools to have more and more organized curricula, have more and more um, formal academic activities, younger and younger. And I think the intuition that uh, carers and parents have is that there's something that's not quite right about that, but it's hard to just, you know, run with your own intuition. And I think it's important that the science very much backs up that, that set of intuitions. So I think the science is saying the same thing that the preschool teachers are saying, which is, not nowadays necessarily what the policymakers or the parents are saying. Well, here's the dilemma that I think we're in. As I said before, for most of history, most of human history, people learned how to be a parent by taking care of children themselves, watching lots of other people take care of children. Um, but that's just not true anymore. We're much more mobile people aren't in the same place as their grandparents, for example, or even their aunts and cousins. So in that kind of a world, we have to figure out, I think of it as figuring out some way to replace the, the aunt or the grandmother or the chance to take care of a child that um, we would have had for most of the time as human beings. So I think if you think of parenting classes as being an opportunity to do that the way that, the way that in the past you would have had that opportunity, you know, going to Aunt Joe's house with her seven children and ten cousins and um, and four uncles. If you think about parenting classes as kind of doing that, then I think they have a lot to offer and and very often just to reassure parents that they can follow their intuitions, that the children and babies will kind of teach them what the right things are to do. Well, you know, carers have been doing a good job of taking care of children for a long time before we did brain science, but I do think the brain science, the fact that it fits so well with a lot of the things that the carers say gives them kind of ammunition, especially if you're talking to the people in power who are, who, and you need to persuade them of things that, things that um, early childhood people might have known all along knowing something about the brain really helps. And, and the other thing about it, which is, goes back to, you know, what, could, what, should parents, uh, what should parents do, is that uh, 
it, one of the great things about it being a parent is that you get to be a witness and a participant in, in really the most amazing miracle on the planet. Every single child uh, learns more between the ages of zero to five than they ever will again, and then any other system that we know of. Um, and part of the reason why I've written my books is that finding out about the science, I think, just makes the experience richer and deeper, um, more fun than than it would be if you didn't. The same way that, you know, uh, if you're a, a birder or a natural historian, knowing something about how biology works um, um, or how horticulture works makes your gardening deeper and more interesting. But not necessarily because there's a bunch of, of recipes that you can learn to make your child come out a particular way. One of the great puzzles of, of evolution is why is it that we have this very long period of childhood with this very long period of helplessness? And one idea is that we're a species that keeps changing our environment, partly because we migrate to new environments, but partly because we do things that make our environment different. So every generation is facing somewhat new problems and new challenges. And the idea is that childhood is a period, this protected period, where a new generation can deal with the new environment that they're in and figure out ways to, to, to um, figure out new ways of coping and thriving in that environment. And if that's true, then in some sense, even if you could accomplish the carpenter, um, even if you could accomplish the carpenter model and you could shape your children to come out a particular way, you would have really defeated the whole purpose of childhood by doing it. Because the whole purpose of childhood is to enable each human generation to have this space in which they can do things that no human generation has ever done before. <laughs>